This is episode 157 of This Week in Marketing Show. Today, I'll be going over the notable news and updates from the digital marketing space from the week of April 17 through 21, 2023. First off, I'm going to start off with an announcement for Twitter, where Twitter is requiring all advertisers to pay for verification first. If you remember back when it was announced, we said, you know, Twitter is going to charge to... Uh, put a blue check mark on your profile and then Instagram followed the whole process where Instagram is also charged. Instagram and Facebook or Meta is charging for verification. Now, Elon Musk has this brilliant idea, which I totally don't dis- agree or disagree. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm confused about what whether I should go for it or against it. But basically, he requires all advertisers to get verified before they can run ads. Now, At a time when Twitter needs ad revenue, I'm not sure it's the best uh, way to get $8 out of an advertiser who's going to eventually spend money on the platform anyways, right? Or maybe $1,000 for organizations. But, you know, hey, to each his own, uh, we'll see if advertisers really uh, take a bite of that or not. But I would think, you know, if you were to say, hey, if you're spending, say, $100 $100 a month, you will automatically get a Twitter blue check mark, right? Because remember, there is, isn't really any uh, verification going on because anyone can uh, create a fake account and get a verification check mark for, by paying $8. So now the question for you is, should you pay or should you not pay for verification? Think about it and let us know if you can. Okay. Next up, uh, here's an announcement from Instagram. Instagram now a- a allows you to uh, add up to five links in your profile bio. This has been a very request. This has been a requested feature in Instagram, to the point where users were forced to use services like Linktree and other link building tools to kind of you know, have one link because that's the only link you could have, and then take it to a landing page where you can have like five, six, seven different l- links, right? And that's how Linktree was born. We at Market and Grow, or I at Market and Grow, never really uh, started off with Linktree free account. But then I realized I had to pay ten dollars a month to get the analytics. I was like, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just basically de- redirect uh, the page to our website. So on our website, we have this planning page that is made specifically for Instagram. It's a tall page so that when you look at mobile, you don't really have all these you know things that you would see on a desktop, and it has all the links that we wanted you to see. Right? Uh, that was a workaround, but now it's good that link uh, Instagram gives you up to five uh, links to add. Uh, which basically means services like Linktree are not going to be as popular as it used to be. And I'm pretty sure uh, TikTok is going to copy this in the future. Next up, now moving into the Google land, uh, Google has said, and John Miller has said, just because a site is on number one today does not mean it will always be number one all forever. Right. And there could be a variety of reasons. Uh, It's probably because, you know, that technology has changed. The competition is better than what it used to be. Or, you know, the new site owners or the site owners haven't kept up, have not invested in content, things like that, or algorithm changes, things like that. This was to a query from a user, Cyan, who said, you know, his sites do not show up on Google News anymore. It used to be. And he's like, what's happened? Right. And John was like, you know what, dude, things change. Uh, so the gist of this update is like, look, folks, SEO is not evergreen, right? Nothing is evergreen. You cannot go get a six pack uh, and be like, oh, that's it. I have six pack. I'm not going to work out. You cannot go and say, you know, I have a beautiful garden. I'm going to not stay up to date. I'm not going to keep it keep it clean, take out the weeds and in, put give water and fertilizers, things like that, right? You got to get at it. So some people, uh, I mean, of course, there are things beyond our control, such as algorithm changes, things like that. But SEO is something you have to stay on it and you have to invest in it continuously, even though you are ranking number one. That's the update. Next up, uh, Google has added a new return policy structured data support for merchant listing. Structured uh, data support is something we have always uh, covered. I am a firm believer in it. Structured data is basically, it's just a way 
it's an industry standard through which Google, when it comes across, it says, you know what, um, the data in here, I understand what it's talking about. I know the fields have been agreed upon. Uh, so if I see this field, just say return type or return duration, I know what it means. There is no gray area. It's one is to one you know, mapping and then kind of allows you to Google, like really understand what's going on. Um, what are the, some of the key information on that page that Google should act a minimum process for you? And you know what? Structured data is very, very important. You should really use it. Uh, and if you're not using it, uh, you know, using it, I think, increases your chances of getting uh, ranked, indexed and ranked, just because it takes less compute power for Google on the other end to kind of figure out what's happening on your web page or else in you know, Google, a lot of things are left up to interpretation and you don't really want that. Anyway, Having given given all these details behind structured metadata, uh, structured metadata, structured uh, data type, uh, Google has now added like a return section uh, that says, you know, what are your return policies? And this is only applicable to people who have Google Merchant Center account have products in there, right? And at the same time, Google has begun showing shipping and return information in search results. Why is that? A lot of people search for products on Google. And now when they see return information, they say free returns, free shipping, free return, 15-day return policy window. It increases your likelihood of the user clicking on the product and... Uh, going to the site and checking it out, right? Think of what happens on Amazon, right? On Amazon, you kind of see, oh, we know we can return it for free. We have 30 days, things like that. But because Google is an aggregator, it gets data feed from all these different merchants. I think this is a step in the right direction where, you know, it increases uh, people, uh, businesses to sell more because now, you know, it's easy for people to find out what your return policies are. In the past, even for me, if I were to come across a Google uh, merchant or a merchant uh, through Google search, I would have to go figure out where the return policies, sometimes it's shipping and, you know, shipping policies, sometimes it's return policies, sometimes it's hidden under customer service. It's a lot of different pages, like, and it's time consuming. So what Google is trying to do is trying to remove the friction out of this whole process so that, you know, again, uh, buyers are more likely to buy because, you know, the return policy is more clear. Now, for example, if you have policies that changes, I think it's better to do it uh, from a Google Merchant Center. Uh, and there is also a de documentation from Google on how you can actually uh, push this data to Google if you are not using structured metadata. So you need to check our show notes and you can figure it out. From, you can read it from there. But for now, I'm assuming you all have the ability to add structured uh, data type or structured metadata to your web page for your product page. And you should definitely do so if you are selling something online through Google. Next up, uh, Google has introduced a new crawler and also explains it, explains the different use case for different crawlers. Number one is that Google's new crawler is going to show up as Google Other Crawler. Google Other, it's one word. So, you know, up until now, you know, you would, Google was using everything as a Google Bot. And whether it's the Google Bot querying your data or qu querying your site for uh, ranking, or Google bought as if they were to uh, you know, get content from your site for Google's internal projects, research, and things like that. So now Google has says, you know what, we're gonna split it off and we're gonna basically create this new crawler type, which is called Google Other, and it's going to be used by product teams for fetching publicly accessible content from sites for research and development. Right, okay. So I think you kind of know, and this is to remove any confusion as to what type of crawler is visiting your website, things like that. At the same time, Google has updated the Google bot page and listed the crawler types, right? So now you have different crawlers, which is basically says, oh, this is the Google bot, or this is the Google other. Now, even within that, now you have uh, other crawlers, special case tr crawlers, uh, that will perform such as, uh, you know, ads bot, right? That will create, crawl your site, look at uh, different content, and they will not r obey or respect the robots.txt rule. And then there are user triggered features. So what are user triggered features? So you go to search console and you say, hey, Google, go uh, fetch my web page 
uh, you go to your Google Search Console and you put in your URL and say, Google, fetch this page, and I want to see how it shows up on Google and give me a rating, right? Or see if you can fetch this page. So those pages are now going to show up as uh, user-triggered fetchers, uh, fetches, and it's going to end up with googleusercontent.com. So <clears throat> what, where Google is going with all this, I think because they foresee the need for fetching a uh, lot of content from the web for their um, Google Bird uh, AI tool, they've, I think they're just like splitting it up. Now, most users, most business owners will not see this unless you are really uh, looking at the web server logs, which again, if you're not on WordPress, and even if you're on WordPress, you probably don't check it. Uh, if you are on think, platforms like Wix, or if you are a platform like, um, I don't know, HubSpot Web, uh, HubSpot CMS, you would not gonna see all these things. Where this matters is number of visitors coming to your site and either adding them to your list, to your site or removing them from your site and kind of computing, okay, what's your real true conversion rate, right? Imagine if of the 10 visits you had, if two were from Google Crawler, whether it's Google Fetch, uh, you fetching the Google content or with this Google Bot or Google Other, you want to subtract the traffic so that you say, well, I actually had in reality eight visits, not 10. And now of that eight, I had two conversions, right? So it changes the ratio, the percentage of your con the conversion rate and all the other factors um, that you're really looking for. Now, tools like Google Analytics and all are pretty good about you know uh, removing the visits from Google bot, especially GF4, you can remove GF4 filters out all this traffic. So you would actually potentially see eight, but I like to compare. Uh, that's just me being me. I want to see what's the raw visits and what's the number reported in Google Analytics. Now also Google Analytics or GF4 will sample. It will not give you 100% accurate. Uh, it just takes a sample of the data and shows you. Again, it's more applicable to sites that get thousands of visits a day. Okay, uh, so now I've, given a lot of information about this topic which you probably are like you know getting dizzy which is fine um, because as a as a website owner you should not be going through the web server logs uh, and skimming through it and see uh, what it is now the one important thing that why you really need to worry about this uh, and review your web server logs at least every two weeks or every three weeks is because Imagine if there was a spammer uh, spamming your system, right? Or a scammer or a troublemaker coming to your system and sending a lot of traffic and you are on a shared hosting. They're sending you so much load that eventually your hosting provider is going to say, you know what, you're taking up too much of, of our you know, resources, we are going to boot you off. You want to be able to catch those things, right? And you you should be able to then block them, those scammers or, or you know troublemakers from your uh, robot.txt file or from a IP address exclusion. You can just like you know block them off. Again, it, I'm going a little bit deep and technical in this, but what I'm saying is that it's imperative. Now, of course, you go to things like uh, Shopify uh, or HubSpot or Wix, and you know, in uh, in their defense, uh, I think this is one of the plus points is they have systems that manage and mitigate those things. Like, you know, or on the other hand, you can have Hub WordPress on a shared hosting and you can use something like Cloudflare that will kind of protect you from all these, you know, bad people trying to hit your site and like, you know, increase your resource usage to the point where they, uh, your hosting provider asks you to offboard, right? Or asks you to go find someone else. Now, on the contrary, there could be legitimate use where you know you publish a report or a blog that went viral and you know hundreds of people are really using it, but you want to be able to understand where your traffic is coming in and things like that. And are these really coming from Google or is this legitimate users or are they just like you know um, you know just scammers or troublemakers, right? So the point here being is that um, you know. As a business owner, you should not be doing it. Most business owners don't need to really review uh, web server logs. Uh, but if you see your business getting tractions, that's when, uh, that is, you know, you are beyond, I would think if I have to guess, beyond like a 300K revenue range, 
you need to start to kind of start looking into uh, digging into the data and finding out okay where are my people coming from are they really visiting our site if so what are they doing because remember if there are again troublemakers are not probably increasing your site usage but they're like you know navigating to different channels of your website uh, different pages of your website spending time you don't want an inaccurate data Right, you don't want like you know. You want to be able to filter those data out, uh, and sometimes uh, troublemakers come and mask it themselves as Google bot. And the best way to do it uh, would be um, look at the IP address, which is only available in the web server logs, and be able to say, okay, these are troublemakers. It's coming in again and again, and this is the trouble they're doing. I hope this helps. I know I went very deep, much very long. It's just that I wanted to break it down and explain to you, you know, why it's important to look at web server logs. Again, you as a business owner should not be looking at it. You should be actually working with a good marketing resource or an expert or specialist who can actually do this for you. And they do this every day, so they can do it pretty quickly and get you the results and say, you know what, here's what's happening uh, and here's what you need to protect against. Okay. Next up, uh, Google has quietly removed all search ranking algorithms updates from its ranking system page. Why they did that, they did not know, but they have quietly removed things like you know the page experience system, mobile friendly system, page uh, speed system, secure system, site system, rankings, things like that. Now, having said that, uh, the, the next update where I just switched into is like Google has is going to remove uh, page experience report, mobile usability remote, and mobile friendly tests from the search console report. So if I kind of tie this thing two together, it seems like Google is removing uh, page experience as a standalone factor. Uh, and it's focusing more on the overall holistic. And why I say this is because uh, the next update, again, let me jump to the next update. These are three different updates, but they are all linking to one another, is that Google is now adding page experience to helpful content guidance. So hang on a second. You're going to say, Sajid, from the ranking systems page, Google has removed page experience uh and page mobile friendly and all these other rankings, like you know the three or four, page experience system, mobile friendly system, page speed system, and secure site system rankings is from their you know Google's ranking systems page. Okay, these are four. They are removing page experience report, mobile usability report, and mobile friendly test from search console report. Now you're telling me, and yes, I am not wrong. It is I am telling you or sharing with you that Google is adding page experience has added. A page experience to the helpful content guidance. What this all means and how it's all coming together, I think, is that Google has basically says, hey, hey, we are not going to count page experience as a standalone one-off thing. It's kind of baked into everything we do because, again, you know, if you look at the page experience, um, you know, understanding page experience uh, documentation in the Google's um, developer guide, what you will see is like you know it talks about all exp like you know experience like is your page does your page load fast is it mobile friendly is it like you know does it uh as does it give you pop-ups it's just like is it hard to uh navigate around is it easy to find information things like that right so help what where this is all going again i'm kind of summarizing it all and if you really want to read you should be reading the show notes and because you know i have a lot of you know a lot of updates in there in terms of what it all means you know in a more probably formal way is that this is coming as Google is going to focus on, of course, helpful content, which is you need to write content not for search engines, but you need to write content for the user, the person you're talking to. And I think that's the best way to explain. You have to write content for the user, number one. And number two is that does that content give up good page experience? Right. So if you want to rank as of April 2023, which can change in May 2023 or December 2023 or January 2024, but as of now, and as if you've been following my show, you know Google keeps changing things. The main emphasis is you need to write great content, right? To answer the person's question, help them with something where you are the expert, you are the authority, and people trust you, and then you add experience on top of it, which is E-E-A-T. Remember, we have covered this when it was announced. And then, so you e a a t is just an experience that kind of envelops everything else. Now, 
is it possible for you to have bad experience and still be ranking? Yes, but the likelihood of you ranking higher or faster if you have better experience is a lot higher, right? That's my understanding, my opinion based on what I've read so far. It's like, you know... Uh, you need to have good experience. Now, of course, there is core web vitals. Uh, page experience was part of core web vitals. So you still have the core web vital score. Now, let me take a pause at this point and ask you, is this all confusing you? Like you are like, Sajid, there's so many things that I have to keep track of now, right? Mobile friendliness, HTTPS, no intrusive inters interstitials, right? I hope I pronounced it right, which is basically that says, sometimes you will go to a web page and you will like, as you're trying to loading, as this page loading up, as you're trying to navigate, read in the page, a pop-up comes in, uh, then there is a, you know, shift, like, you know, this thing comes and the shift changes where, what I mean by shift is like, you know, a box comes, it changes around, you know, things like that. And there are sites that do that. So Google is looking at all those things. Um, so, Gist of this whole thing I'm trying to tell you is that how you design your web page and how it looks up on how it looks like on mobile and how it really uh, how fast it loads and how many pop-ups you have makes a huge difference to whether you are going to get ranked or not. Period. I hope this helps because that's it for this week in marketing. Until next week, I'm signing off. Yours host, Ajit Islam. Take care. Bye bye.